Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the session. I'm delighted to be with you this evening, and I'm very, very proud of all of you who are here on a Saturday to learn and share experiences. So welcome to the session. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for tonight. We have Dr. Ali al muqbili He is uh, joining us today from Oman. He obtained his medical degree in 1998 at Sultan Qaboos University. He then did internal medicine residency training in Oman and did fellowship in endocrine and diabetes at King Faisal Specialist Hospital in KSA. Uh, disorders of sexual development are one of his areas of interest and he runs a specialized clinic dealing with such cases, which is a great opportunity to discuss the cases we have today. He is the deputy director of the National Diabetes Endocrine Center in Muscat and the program director of Adult Diabetes Fellowship in Oman. Without further ado, I welcome you, Dr. Ali, to the session, and we will listen to your talk about abnormal sexual development cases. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Dalal, for the nice introduction. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure today to speak about disorders of sex development. And in my talk, I'm going to discuss a few cases, give overview of disorders of sex differentiation, and finally, I give a short summary. The focus in today's talk would be on adult cases and on challenges of diagnosis. Our first patient is a 30-year-old female who has primary amenorrhea. She's married since two years, and she was started in OCB after marriage, and she got some cycles. But due to infertility, she was evaluated, and her LH and FSH are very high. And interestingly, her karyotype was 46XY. Her eldest sister has a similar issue, but never evaluated. Now, in examination, she is told no facial dysmorphism, and she has completely female phenotype, including well-formed breast and external female genitalia. Her hemoglobin is 13, her potassium is 4.6, and her testosterone is normal for a female reference. Her LH and FSH are high. She has normal cortisol, ACTH, and 17 hydroxyprogesterone. Her karyotype confirmed that she is 46XY and the SRY gene is positive. The MRI showed hypoblastic uterus and absent bilateral ovaries. So we are dealing with a 46XY female phenotype low testosterone, hypoblastic uterus. And the question is, what is the likely diagnosis? Now, to answer this question, we need to know little about disorder of sex development, which is a term given to infants born with genitals that do not appear typically male or female or who have an appearance discordant with the chromosomal sex. The old names like intersex, pseudohermatophytes, have been replaced by this newer term, disorder of sex development. And disorder of sex development are classified into three major categories. Six chromosome disorder of sexual development, 46XY, and 46XX DST. Our patient has 46XY DST, so the defect would be one of these. Now, the difference between males and females in terms of the sexual organs and characters lies in the in five Gs. This is the simplest I could summarize it. G number one is genome, which contains the chromosomes and the genes, then gonads, genital tracts, genitalia. Genome affects everything. It does affect the gonads, which would affect the genital tracts and might affect the, the genitalia. And the last G is the general appearance, which is basically the secondary sexual characters. So patients with DSD would have a problem at one or more of these Gs. 
As you know, females can have less or more X chromosomes, but males cannot live without X chromosome as 45Y is fatal, but they can have extra X chromosomes. Now one person can have mixed male and female karyotype. Now these are set of genes required for both males and females, and there are semi-specific genes required for each sex. For example, for 46XY, the SRY gene is needed for testicular development. Now, a 46XX female can change to a male phenotype if there is SRY translocation, SOX9 duplication, or RSBO1 mutation. Similarly, the opposite can happen if one of these changes occur. Now, early in life, everybody has a biopotential gonad that is going to become testis or ovaries depending on the genes. Early in life, everybody has Mullerian duct and Wolfian duct. One of these ducts is going to progress and the other is going to regress depending in the presence or absence of testis. And these are the derivatives of Wolfian duct and Mullerian duct abbreviated as three Vs and three Us. Now, in the presence of Y chromosome, which usually has the SRY gene, the undifferentiated gonad is going to differentiate into testis, and the testis would have leading cell that would secret testosterone for maintaining Wolfian duct structures, and testosterone will be also converted to dihydrotestosterone that is important in viralization of external genitalia. The testis will have Sertoli cells that is going to secret the malarian inhibitory substance to inhibit the malarian duct development. Now, early in life also, the external genitalia looks the same in both, and at 8 to 12 weeks of gestation, viralization can happen depending on the presence or absence of dihydrotestosterone. Now, a 46X, uh, a 46 XY DSD can have a problem in the testis where there is testicular maldevelopment over testicular conditions, dysgenesis, regression. The problem can happen at the biosynthesis of testosterone where one of these enzymes is defective. It can be at the LH receptor or it can be at the LH and GNRH. But usually this happens later, this is a concern later in pregnancy because in the initial phase of pregnancy, the placental CD is the one that drives LH. The problem can be at the level of the strong conversion to DHT or at the androgen receptors. So a defect at one of these sites might cause a, 40, a, 40, a 46 XY DHT. Now, this, this loves the number seven start differentiating at, we, at, at week seven and start descending and the scrotum fuses by 70 days of gestation and the testis is at the, around the inguinal by seven months. And it uses all enzymes containing the number seven for biosynthesis of testosterone in addition to 3-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Now, this shows you the differential effects of testosterone and dihydrotestosterone in the male internal and external genital structures. Of course, the dihydrotestosterone is important for viralization of the external genitalia as well as development of prostate, while testosterone is important for internal male genitalia development. And these are the additional effects of both hormones. Now, this summarizes the female and male internal and external genitalia and your genital signs. And if you look carefully, the process in females is mostly passive. They need estrogen for further uterus development. Now, case number two, we have a 22-year-old female and at age 14 years, she was noticed by her physician to have some skin protrusion at pubic area. So she was raised as a female, and later 
this was evaluated. She was reassured initially that this is lipoma, re-evaluated again, and the karyotype was 46XY. She decided to convert to male, but after finishing her school. So she presented to us for the process of conversion from female to male at age of 22. Now, in examination, she has some female phenotypes. She has some hair, no breast. And interestingly, she has a scrotum and testis in one side, no scrotum or testis in the other side. She has clitoromegaly or micropenis and blind pouch. She has a male level hemoglobin. Her potassium is 4.5. Her testosterone done twice is high. Her LH and FSH normal. She has normal cortisol, ACTH, and 17 hydroxy. Her DHT, which we do it usually outside Oman, as it's not available in our lab, is in the mid reference range for females. Her karyotype confirmed that she has 46XY karyotype and the SRY gene is positive. The MRI showed an inguinal lesion in the side of the absent testis. Probably this is undescended testis. So we have 46XY, ambiguous genitalia, high testosterone, normal DHT. And what is the likely diagnosis? So this, this fits very well with partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. However, she has no breasts. And that argues against partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. And when we look back at the dihydrotestosterone, remember that the identity of this patient is still female. And for a male reference of DHT, the DHT is low, actually. The testosterone over dihydrotestosterone is 50. So the likely diagnosis is 5-alpha reductase deficiency. And this was proved genetically. So the diagnosis of 5-alpha reductase 2 deficiency is supported by normal or high testosterone, testosterone over dihydrotestosterone more than 20, and urinary metabolites. In children and infants, we need SCG stimulation. In adults, we are auto-stimulated. We don't need that. And because measurement of the urinary analyte is difficult and not widely available, a measurement of DHT with immunosays may be unspecific. Genetic confirmation is usually required. The presentation is very interesting. During infancy, this condition might have very mild ambiguity to the degree that it passes unnoticed as what happened in our patients. So we don't blame the parents for not discovering this patient. But during puberty, because of high testosterone and therefore DHT, there will be viralization to various degrees. Now, the isozyme type 2 is de defective while type 1 is normal, and the low but measurable serum concentrations of DHT is due to normal type 1 isozyme and residual activity of the mutant enzyme. And type 1 becomes important during puberty. It's found in non-genital skin, while type 2 is important early in life and expressed in genital skin. And this is the usual pathway for synthesis of THT through isozyme 2. And this is the backdoor pathway for synthesis through isozyme 1, which becomes very prominent when isozyme 2 is blocked. For androgen syndrome in XY, they can be more of male or female phenotype, depending on the degree of insensitivity. But complete androgen sensitivity will have external female phenotype with gynecomastia. And remember that testosterone and dihydrotestosterone bind to the same intracellular androgen receptor. Now, this is a very important clue for adult physicians for such cases. We know that breast development requires some estrogen. It's antagonized by androgen, more correctly by testosterone. So conditions that 
give us low estrogen like severe safantine alpha hydroxylase deficiency would have no breast development conditions. Also like 5 alpha reductase where testosterone is high and is functioning, it inhibits breast development. While conditions like androgen syndrome where testosterone is high but it's not functioning, the breast development will occur. So why such cases present late and not detected early? These are some of the reasons. Maybe complete phenotype six reversal, mild ambiguity, associated conditions like hypertension that usually becomes of concern during adulthood, primary amenorrhea, absence of breast, buberatal induced change of external genitalia and or secondary sexual characters. And in our patient, it is because of these two things. Now, our third patient is a 37-year-old female, difficult to control hypertension and cause features. She is on multiple medications for blood pressure, and she has been having primary amenorrhea, and she got OCBs, but there was no withdrawal bleeding. So she got referred to us because of cause features query acromegaly. And when we examined her, she has cause features, but no acromegalic features. She is tall, muscular, no breast, and complete external female genitalia. Her biochemistry showed a picture of a primary hyperaldosteronism. Aldosterone is higher in its breast, and a picture mimicking premature of air and failure. Estradiol is low, LH and FSH are high. Her potassium is in the lower side, 3.6, and she has a normal IGF-1, which is against acromegaly. The karyotype was 466Y, and the SRY gene is present. Interestingly, her cortisol is low, ACTH is high, and she has very high corticosterone. So we are dealing with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and this is her MRI of the pelvis shows, showing structures in the inguinal area, most likely and descended testis. So what is the likely diagnosis? So to know where is the block, we need to come to this figure. And as you know, the uh, aldosterone synthesis is controlled by the RAS system, while the steroids and other steroids biosynthesis is controlled by ACTH, including the androgens. And these are the different enzymes. And a block at one of these enzymes would give us high precursors, pre-block and low uh, post block metabolites, and we need to fit our patient in this. Now, in a busy clinic, I usually use this. So I divide into a female genotype if I'm dealing with a female, or a male genotype, and the numbers three is common for both. Three beta hydroxy three beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase can cause ambiguity in both males and females, but this is not of a major concern for initial presentation in adulthood because this is usually presents in unit. Now, for females, it is descending order 3 to 1, 21 alpha hydroxylase and 11 beta hydroxylase. These are the causes, enzyme defects for congenital adrenal hyperplasia causing ambiguity in a female karyotype. And for male, it is 357 ascending order. So these are not strictly the congenital adrenal hyperplasia, but all enzymes with numbers. 5 alpha reductase and 17 alpha hydroxylase, 17 20 lyase, 17 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Now, this helps me a lot in my clinic. And to narrow the differential diagnosis further, these two conditions would be associated with high blood pressure. Now, our patients, if you look at the metabolites of our patients, it fits with 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, and this was proved genetically. Uh, we thank Dr. Ali Zahrani for doing this for us. Now, the, uh, our patient has high aldosterone, and the typical cases will have low aldosterone. And when looking at the literature, there are some cases where you find the aldosterone is normal or high in such cases. And it seems because the block is so severe, the corticosterone is very high and it just diffuses to aldosterone. And there are increasing case reports about this. 
the presentation of 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency can be variable in males and females. And why such cases are not detected earlier? It's because of these th three things in our patient. The last case is a 48 year old male. He's married, no kids, one year increasing abdominal swelling with some discomfort. And he underwent CT abdomen, which showed huge mass, 20 centimeters, query malignant lesion. And there are suprarenal, which are like adrenal masses, most likely originating from the malignant lesion from the abdomen. In examination, he's short. He has male phenotype. The only abnormality, he has empty scroti and no testis in the scroti. And his testosterone is normal. His cortisol is normal. He has also normal beta HCG and alpha theta protein. So what is the likely diagnosis? Looking at this patient with undescendant testis, somebody would think of malignancy like gonadoblastoma. He underwent biopsy of the abdominal lesion and it showed benign smooth muscle fibers repeated and it was benign smooth muscle fibers. And strikingly, this is his MRI showing big uterus with fibroid. His labs again, testosterone is normal, elephant, estradiol is 227, LHNFSH are suppressed. His ACTH is markedly high and yet he has normal basal cortisol. There is no increase after synactin. He has very high 17 hydroxyprogesterone as well as androstadione, normal elephant doc. The karyotype was 46XX. So this is congenital adrenal hyperplasia presenting for the first time at age of 48 and it's a bit like a typical presentation. And we're trying to fit this patient in this figure. And this is a, a, a female karyotype, three to one. We usually exclude three. We're remaining with 21 and elephant. And this does not fit 100%. So we're trying to look at rare uh, atypical congenital adrenal hyperplasia and also does not fit. But it does fit like 80% in this. So the differential between 21 and 11. So there are a lot of diagnostic challenges in this case, which is beyond the scope of this presentation. There'll be a lot of management challenges also in such a case, which is also beyond the scope of this presentation. We have proven that this patient have 21 hydroxylase deficiency through a genetic study. And this is his uterus and and adrenals after surgery. He has big uterus and big adrenals around 18 centimeter bilaterally. And so in summary, I spoke about five Gs. The physical examination would help us identify the genitalia and the secondary sexual characters. It might help identifying the gonads. We would require imaging and labs for the gonads and the genital tracts. We always require karyotyping and sometimes specific gene study. DSD with atypical genitalia is usually picked up in the neonatal period. DSDs presenting at adulthood are likely to have complete phenotype six reversal, mild ambiguity, hypertension, primary amenorrhea, absence of breast, or pubertal induced change of external genitalia and or secondary sexual characters. Atypical genitalia caused by enzyme defect is due to in females three to one descending order and in males three, five, seven. For the proper diagnosis, we need proper history, physical examination and targeted investigations. There are three diagnostic tools for adult endocrinologists and not for pediatric endocrinologists, the presence or absence of breasts, viralization at puberty, HCG autostimulation. The hormone investigation should be ordered and interpreted in the context of suspected diagnosis and reference ranks according to genotype six, 
reports of karyotyping and structural images should not suggest only one diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. That was fascinating. And we really enjoyed how you simplified and clearly described these interesting cases. I also thank you for sticking to the time. That was perfectly timed. I will move on to our next speaker, and then we will do the panel discussion, inshallah. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Abdul Majid Al Subahin. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics, College of Medicine, King Saud University. He's a consultant in pediatric endocrinology and child bone health at the Medical City of the King Saud University. And Dr. Abdul Majid, we welcome you to the session. You may share your slides. We look forward to your talk on hypoparathyroidism. Uh, thank you for the organizing committee uh, for giving me the uh, opportunity to present at uh, such an esteemed uh, uh, Congress of the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes. Um, I will talk to you today about hypoparathyroidism, hoping to present an overview of the clinical presentation and treatment strategies. In uh, my uh, presentation, I'll touch on calcium homeostasis, the order and the disorder. Uh, then I'll talk about clinical presentation and diagnosis of hypoparathyroidism. Uh, following this, uh, I'll touch on management goals and end uh, about few bullet points uh, on future directions. Calcium homeostasis, uh, when looked at, reminds us uh, uh, with a busy uh, intersection uh, of traffic um, the, the, this is due to the uh, huge amount of influx and efflux of calcium uh, in and out uh, our bodies, which requires order uh, to regulate uh, that calcium traffic without causing any uh, complications to uh, our uh, bodies. If I summarize the um, uh, players of the calcium homeostasis uh, system uh, in one slide. This is how the slide would look like. I apologize if the slide uh, is too busy, uh, but I can, however, uh, walk you through how uh, this slide was built. So we are going to start with this small, small box and call it the intravascular space. This intravascular space is filled with um, multiple molecules and uh, cations and anions, including the calcium. The calcium is maintained in the intravascular space within uh, a narrow range. This maintenance is made through um, players in the homeostasis system that interact with each other to achieve this. Um, the first player is the parathyroid cell, along with its sensing mechanism, to test that sensing mechanism, let's just try to tamper with the calcium level in our intravascular space. So if we push the calcium level down, that will, um, uh, that will turn off the extracellular component of the calcium sensing uh, receptors, which uh, will lead to cessation of the signal uh, intracellularly and the disassembly of the um, uh, proteins downstream, which leads to uh, releasing the brakes on PTH synthesis and PTH release. PTH then departs the parathyroid cell uh, towards it, its um, uh, target tissues. These include the um, uh, PTH1 receptor on the osteoblast cells of the bone, which activates the osteoclasts subsequently leading to uh, bone turnover um, uh, manipulation uh, in favor of bone resorption. This leads to release of mineral back to the uh, bloodstream from the calcified tissue. The PTH1 receptor at the kidney and the kidney tubule uh, leads then to phosphaturia and uh, reabsorption of calcium back into the system Further, it activates the 1-alpha-hydroxylase enzyme, leading to uh, hydroxylation of the 25-hydroxyvitamin D into the 1-25-dehydroxyvitamin D, which departs to the gut and leads to calcium absorption 
and phosphorus absor absorption with the net results of restoration of our calcium. Now, if we talk about the disorders that occur in the system, then uh, autosomal dominant mutation in the calcium sensing receptor, which leads to um, overactivation of the receptor uh, and uh, over sensing of calcium, this leads to a new set point of calcium where uh, the parathyroid cell uh, tends to keep calcium in lower range. Uh, the parathyroid cell is also subject to uh, injury, including surgery, radiation, or uh, hemochromatosis. Uh, in the pediatric population, uh, we occasionally deal with congenital hypoparathyroidism due to mutations in transcription factors that are important for the um, formation and uh, survival uh, of the parathyroid cell in utero. These include TBX1, of which mutations are known to cause D. George syndrome, CHD7, uh, of which mutations cause CHARGE syndrome, the GATA3 mutations cause uh, HDR, uh, the TBCE mutations cause Sanjat-Satati and Kenny cafe syndrome. Um, mitochondrial DNA alterations causing mitochondrial disease. This is also known to affect the parathyroid cells uh, in uh, Kern-Sire syndrome and Milas syndrome. Um, mutations in the, in the PTH molecule itself cause auto, autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive hypoparathyroidism. Autoimmunity against the parathyroid cell or um, antibodies ag against the calcium sensing receptors leading to activations are known to, uh, in, in patients with APS uh, type 1. Also not to forget about magnesium as both hypermagnesemia uh, or uh, hypomagnesemia uh, are known uh, to alter the function of the parathyroid cell, uh, which may lead to hypoparathyroidism. Now in terms of clinical presentations, uh, these differed according to age groups, for example, in newborns and infants. Um, these these um, individuals usually present with incidental biochemical finding, um, but most occasionally uh, seizures is the, is the presenting symptoms. Titany, recurrent striders, and delayed motor milestones are also presentations of hypoparathyroidism in this age group. Uh, when children are, are older, uh, enough to, um, uh, when children are old enough to express the, um, the uh, neuromuscular uh, signs and symptoms associated with hypoparathyroidism, they start complaining about tetany and tingling, muscle cramps, and they are noticed to be fatigued. They also may present with seizures. In adolescents and adults, uh, they usually present with tetany, tingling, muscle cramps, and fatigues. Some of the adults may be uh, discovered to have hypoparathyroidism uh, or hypocalcemia through uh, workup of, of uh, palpitations or chest pain where ECG uh, shows findings that are in keeping with hypocalcemia. Um, there is also this description of the brain fog feeling or which leads to decreased uh, quality of life in these individuals. Hypocalcemia or hypoparathyroidism is a multi-systemic disease. Um, these systems are either affected by hypocalcemia itself or by the lack of parathyroid hormone uh, effects on peripheral tissues. Uh, also, these tissues are perhaps affected by the conventional therapy that we administer to, to these uh, individuals. So uh, there are certain associations with hypoparathyroidism uh, that the clinician should be aware of, especially um, uh, clinicians who uh, practice uh, in the pediatric field. So I try to, to make these associations in triads to make them easy to remember. So in a, in a child or infant with congenital cardiac or aortic anomalies, cleft palate or palatopharyngeal insufficiency, and learning disabilities with hypoparathyroidism, D. George syndrome should be thought of. 
the infant or child with growth retardation, microcephaly, and global developmental delay, and hypoparathyroidism. This is usually seen in Sanjat Sakati syndrome. The child with sensory neural, sensory neural hearing loss, renal agenesis, and uterine anomalies, a female. Uh, this is usually seen in HDR, also known as Barakat syndrome. The child with coloboma, cardiac anomalies, growth retardation, and hypoparathyroidism. This is in keeping with CHARGE syndrome, uh, recurrent fungal infections of the mucocutaneous membranes, onycholysis, and alopecia. This is usually seen in autoimmune cholendocrinopathy syndrome type 1. Uh, in terms of the diagnostic criteria, they, they, these uh, were devised by the consensus statement and the uh, guidelines by Endocrine Society published in 2016. So they suggest hypocalcemia, uh, that is albumin corrected in two different occasions separated by two weeks, undetectable or inappropriately low PTH measured by second or third generation immunoassays, phosphate level in the upper normal or frankly elevated uh, helpful but not mandatory criterion. In terms of management goals, uh, the first uh, step in after identifying these individuals is to establish a multidisciplinary team. Uh, this team should in include, of course, an endocrinologist, a nephrologist, a clinical dietitian, an ophthalmologist, audiologist, neurologist, psychologist, psychiatrist, and a physiotherapist, and perhaps more uh, uh, specialties uh, if the clinical situation uh, requires so. The second goal is to achieve near normal calcium level. Uh, this is uh, achieved through optimizing dietary calcium and vitamin D intake. Uh, so these patients should be uh, constantly reviewed by uh, clinical dietitians. Uh, the second strategy to achieve this is uh, through the use of calcium salts. Um, in uh, our region, we, we have calcium carbonate and calcium globulinate uh, available uh, as syrups that, that are suitable for children and infants. Um, calcium carbonate is also available in uh, chewable tabs or, or, or tabs that are suitable uh, for adults. The third strategy to achieve this is the, through the use of active vitamin D, calcidiol or calcitriol. Uh, calcitriol is unfortunately available in uh, capsules only, so it is uh, not suitable for the use in uh, infants or little children. Instead, calcidiol, which is uh, available as oral drops, uh, is used. Another goal is to achieve normal range phosphate levels. Now, the strategies that help the clinician to achieve this is through optimizing calcium and active vitamin D uh, doses. Uh, calcium salts bind phosphorus, so they, they can hit two birds with one stone, uh, correcting the calcium level and reducing the uh, phosphate levels uh, in the serum. Active vitamin D doses should be optimized uh, just enough to facilitate calcium absorption, uh, but high doses should be avoided uh, as these would also facilitate uh, phosphor phosphorus absorption through the gut. Uh, diet modifications might uh, be required in, in patients with uh, difficulties to achieve normal phosphate levels. Uh, this is done through uh, reduction of phosphorus intake uh, in the diet. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, strategies to control uh, phosphate uh, levels in the serum is through the use of phosphate binders. And this is uh, usually resorted to in patients with uh, difficulties to achieve normal phosphate. Uh, another goal is to minimize hypercalciuria. Uh, this is required to preserve uh, the renal functions and to avoid uh, the formation of uh, renal stones. And this is again for optimizing calcium and active vitamin D. 
uh, through achieving uh, uh, near normal calcium level and avoiding normal or high calcium um, uh, serum levels. Low salt diet uh, in combination of hydrochlorothiazide is another strategy to minimize hypercalciuria. Hydrochlorothiazide is, however, contraindicated for uh, in, in individuals with hypoparathyroidism associated with Barter syndrome or tubulopathies. In regards to monitoring and follow-up, so all of these individuals should be seen every three to six months uh, with, uh, uh, in uh, a, a practice uh, that is experienced in uh, the management of uh, hypoparathyroidism. Uh, in each visit, uh, calcium, phosphate, magnesium, BUN, and creatinine, EGFR, uh, should be assessed and done uh, uh, as frequently as uh, the uh, clinical situation requires. 24-hour urine for calcium creatinine ratio uh, as clinically indicated. In children, we tend to uh, screen uh, hypercalciuria uh, by checking the spot urine calcium creatinine ratio on every visit. Uh, renal ultrasound uh, is recommended yearly or every two years in these individuals to screen for uh, nephrocalcinosis. Uh, brain CT scans and eye, eye exams are uh, indicated uh, whenever there is concern about um, the uh, function uh, of the basal ganglia as these are prone for, to calcifications in these conditions. Eye exams are also in, indicated uh, for uh, screening of the associated complications such as uh, cataract and papilledema. Um, in, in terms of the management strategies that we have spoken about thus far, uh, these all uh, are uh, labeled as the conventional therapy. Now, there, there has been issues about the con conventional therapy in uh, the treatment of uh, hypoparathyroidism. These issues include the fact that this strategy does not correct the fundamental disorder of the condition, which is the PTH deficiency. Uh, further, hypercalciuria and decreased phosphorus clearance continue to be an issue because of the uh, lack of uh, PTH in the system. The bone turnover is known to be lower than um, uh, individuals with PTH uh, sufficiency, which leads to increased bone density uh, and perhaps uh, increased uh, risk of fractures due to the ability uh, of the uh, calcified tissues to achieve good uh, modeling and remodeling. Uh, the quality of life continues to be decreased in these individuals despite conventional therapy and, and more. A, a, a good number of these individuals describe the feeling of the brain fog, which really impact their uh, quality of life. Uh, the burden to medical care systems continue to be a concern as these individuals require uh, multiple visits to the hospital, multiple, multiple biochemical uh, testing, and, and to add to the mix children that we follow up with hypoparathyroidism uh, have variable calcium levels, and they tend to uh, require multiple hospitalization as their calcium uh, levels tend to uh, plummet each time the, the child catches a virus or has uh, a, a, gas, uh, a bout of gastroenteritis, um, and, and this, of course, adds to uh, the um, quality of life compromise of these children and families. To overcome these issues, nowadays um, the uh, era of uh, PTH um, analogs have, uh, has, has come to us, so there are two uh, PTH analogs that are known uh, or being used in, in uh, patients. The first analog is the recombinant PTH uh, that contains the 
uh, first 34 uh, amino acids from the uh, N terminus. This is called for TAO. This is FDA approved for osteoporosis in adults. The use in hypoparathyroidism remains off label. Uh, there has been a concern that the use of recombinant PTH in humans might increase the risk of uh, osteosarcoma in individuals with, with um, uh, open growth plates, in individuals in, uh, can, in, with, with a skeleton that continues to grow. Uh, this is based on um, uh, studies done on rodents who receive uh, three, more than three times of the usual dose that is given to human because of this theoretical uh, risk, uh, the, the black box warning uh, continues uh, to, to be uh, an issue. Uh, the black box warning of osteosarcoma was however removed from the Forteo uh, product. On the other hand, the complete uh, molecule of recombinant PTH, uh, the, the molecule, the 1 to 84 um, amino acid uh, molecule, uh, is is another option. Um, uh, the, 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 the other molecule uh, is if they approved for hypoparathyroidism in adults, if conventional therapy has failed, uh, it continues to bear the black box warning or the osteo of the osteosarcoma. This is uh, the, a landmark randomized control trial uh, to show the efficacy of uh, the uh, 1 to 84 uh, recombinant human parathyroid uh, hormone, or uh, no, also known as NAT-PARA. Uh, the, 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 the trial is called the REPLACE trial. It involved uh, 134 individuals from uh, eight uh, different uh, countries. Uh, these individuals uh, were randomized to receive one daily injections of uh, recombinant parathyroid hormone uh, with a placebo. Uh, the, 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 both arms continue to receive conventional therapy with end point was to reduce um, conventional therapy doses but more than 50% with maintenance of calcium level to levels uh, comparable to baseline or slightly above but not above the normal range of calcium. And the study has shown success uh, of reaching the primary endpoint in nearly um, 53 uh, percent uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, at the end of the study, which, which is 24 weeks, with uh, a safety profile uh, that did not differ from, from uh, the active group and the placebo group. Uh, in terms of future direction, so these uh, interventions, I mean, the use of recombinant um, human parathyroid hormone uh, should fall within protocols that are optimized to um, deal with uh, long-term complications. So more studies are required uh, in, in that regard. Establishing safety and, tolerab and tolerability of PTH analogs in, in children uh, is still required. There are few studies that looked at uh, the, the use of PTH analogs in children. Um, however, large studies to establish the safety are required. Um, we are looking also into uh, other delivery methods that may come in the future of uh, PTH analogs. For example, there, are, there, there is a study or two that looked into the continuous subcutaneous infusion pumps in uh, delivering PTH. There might be other uh, modes of delivery of PTH, uh, like the, the, the oral route or the intranasal route that we might hear about in the future to improve the uh, quality of life in, in these individuals. I'd like to thank you now, uh, and I'm happy to uh, hear any comments or questions. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Majid. That was an outstanding talk. And um, perhaps I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. My name is uh, Dalala Rumehi. I'm a consultant adult endocrinologist from King Hamad University at Bahrain, and I'm an associate professor at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. 
So if I may again ask all our participants, please, if they have any questions or outstanding speakers to put them in the chat box or the Q&A, and I'll be happy to ask on your behalf. We had very interesting concepts. I learned a lot myself. There are questions already in the Q&A, but perhaps I'll start from a question from myself. Um, if we start with you, Dr. Ali, um, I'm, you're, I'm listening to your cases and I'm wondering how busy is your clinic what are the types of referrals that you get so that our audience know when to refer patients for evaluation? Is it mainly amenorrhea? When should we refer? Actually, uh, we tend to have cluster of cases. For example, like the last year, we have a cluster of cases. They are uncommon, actually, but uh, uh, the, the issue here is that if these patients have complete six reversal, they will pass unnoticed until a later stage. Um, now, uh, my clinic uh, is introduced uh, uh, recently, and the aim of it is to gather these cases. So uh, any patient fitting in disorder of sexual development, we do receive uh, him or her in our clinic, and we are expanding it to a multidisciplinary clinic involving psychiatrists and other uh, specialized uh, uh, physicians. That's a great resource to have for referrals. Um, for Dr. Abdul Majid, if I may ask you about the target vitamin D we should try to achieve in these patients. Is it different than the general population? And some physicians stop the vitamin D because the patient is on active vitamin D. If you could elaborate on that, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Dalal, for uh, uh, this question. Yes, so the, the uh, target of 25 hydroxyvitamin D uh, in, in this population has not been really discussed uh, very well in the literature. Now, uh, some, some may say, well, since they are on active vitamin D, then uh, what's, what's the point of, of giving them the, uh, or filling their stores with, with the 25 hydroxyvitamin D? Uh, now, I'm not sure about the answer because there might be physiological effects of 25 hydroxyvitamin D that we are not aware of. So I tend to monitor 25 hydroxyvitamin D in these children, at least from my from from the population uh, that that I, I serve, and and try to achieve a, a normal range um, uh, by 25 hydroxyvitamin D. And I have to say that I, I cannot. Uh, back myself up with good evidence for this. Thank you so much, because we do notice if the vitamin D is not sufficient, you chase calcium harder. There must be a value of having both the active and uh, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. There's a question from Dr. Asmadeep for you, Dr. Ali, if I may read it from the Q&A. She says, great talk. Uh, in your experience of 17 hydroxylase deficiency, does hydrocortisone replacement control blood pressure, or they would still need to add antihypertensives? Uh, great question. Uh, we have few cases of 17 alpha hydroxylase, and because uh, this has been long standing and controlled uh, blood pressure, uh, most of uh, almost all of our patients require additional one or two uh, antihypertensive treatments like spinalactone and others. So it is not enough usually, yeah. And you think you attribute that to the chronicity of their hypertension leading to some yes. damage? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And then there's a question for you, Dr. Abdul Majid, if I may. Um, for how long can we use Forteo in patients with hypoparathyroidism who are not controlled with conventional treatment if we do not have available 180? for RPTH? Uh, yeah, so in that regard, I'm, I'm afraid that I don't have, or I haven't come across any, any data that looked at uh, long-term safety. Uh, I have come across a study that looked at eight-year uh, uh, outcomes uh, on, on NATPARA, the uh, 1 to 84 uh, amino acid uh, recombinant PTH. Uh, so one may, one may argue that 
they they are almost the same, but um, I, I can't be sure. Especially with pediatrics, and their growth plates are open, so we don't know the long-term data. Exactly. So in, in pediatrics, we seldom use uh, these products. Um, in, my, in my career, I only saw uh, two children uh, with uh, AO products. One uh, was with uh, APS type 1 who, who uh, failed uh, conventional therapy and and responded very well on on for, for Teo and that that child was uh, an adolescent and used it for almost three years and she was happy on it uh, the problem is that it it, it in, 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 in that child required uh, sometimes up to three injections per day in order to maintain uh, good calcium levels uh, the other child was a child with Sanjit Sakati syndrome who uh, who require two injections per day in order to uh, maintain calcium levels. Unlike the NATPARA study, the replay study, where, where more than half of the uh, active arm uh, individuals were able to achieve um, the, the, the good, good uh, calcium uh, levels with only one uh, injection per day. That's fascinating. And Dr. Ali, there's a question. I think they want us to reflect back on case number three. I think that's your 37-year-old female with secondary hypertension. Uh, the question is, why aldosterone went up in that case? Is that the case of the high corticosterone, if you can elaborate for our attendees? Yes. So uh, that's a great question. I, uh, I threw some light on this. So usually the, uh, the precursors will inhibit renin and therefore the aldosterone becomes low. And in our case, the aldosterone is high. And it seems if the block is so severe, you have a lot of metabolized pre-block and it just diffuses to aldosterone. That's the only explanation. And there are uh, a lot of case reports highlighting this, especially from the Gabonese group. Thank you. And if I ask you again, Dr. Abdul Majid, about the outcome of therapy, that was very important. So it's not just biochemical improvement, but we want to see hardcore outcomes. So for children, what is expected for their uh, bone health? What is expected for their growth development, their stature? Yeah, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, results are what clinical trials publish and, and outcomes is what, what makes it to the news. So. Uh, unfortunately, in children, th there aren't sufficient studies that, that looks at the, how, how children uh, change or how their quality of life change while on uh, PTH. And it's, it's because that there is a concern, a big concern of using recombinant PTH in children due to the black box warning. Now, in adults, um, well, I think there should be studies looking at uh, rate of calcification in the basal ganglia, basal ganglia function uh, over a long uh, term of follow-up, renal function over long term of follow-up, cost effectiveness and burden to medical uh, healthcare systems. Now, w one thing that, that has been looked at is, is the brain fog uh, feeling that, that most of adults express when, when they are uh, suffering from, from hypopara. And, and, and th this feeling has been uh, significantly reduced uh, in, in uh, individuals who took the uh, recombinant um, uh, parathyroid hormone. Uh, they also improved in, in uh, uh, quality of life scores. So that, that is very encouraging. And we hope to see this in children soon. Absolutely. And Dr. Ali, uh, I must ask this question. I know you said it's outside the scoop, but what to tell them, how do, to deal with them? I think it's almost as challenging as finding the right gene and the right diagnosis and what pathway went wrong. And we discuss this sometimes, or I, I see chat uh, discussions in the uh, uh, endocrinologists group saying what to do in the Gulf. How do we deal with it religiously, socially, legally? And we shy away from it, we withdraw from it as clinicians, 
but patients' rights are there and we have to be there to support them. So what are your comments on that? And maybe Dr. Abdul Majid will also comment on this issue. Yes, so uh, this is really very difficult. And uh, I think two or three of uh, the cases I presented, they are already married. Uh, and it's very difficult at this point to disclose the 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 condition and what to do with the uh, wife or the husband do you disclose to them uh, is the marriage like religiously fine should they get divorced there are a lot of questions and uh, what we do we do it in like uh, a graded sessions and we involve a multidisciplinary team uh, including the psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, uh, and uh, we have also DST committee and ethical committee in our hospital, and we are in contact with the religious uh, people. So we involve all of them in the decision before disclosing anything. And luckily, things went fine uh, to the degree that was not expected. We still have like two or three cases who are already married for several years, and uh, we just discovered them now, and now we are struggling how to disclose the issues. Uh, it has to be very careful, and it should be tailored to our tradition, to our uh, like religion and beliefs, uh, uh, and this might need like a full uh, session and discussion and there will be no consensus, uh, but we we do it for uh, the favor of our like uh, uh, culture and religion usually. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for ra raising this point, uh, Professor Dalal. I do I do agree that uh, this area is still part of. Uh, a, a taboo that that doesn't really get touched when it, when it comes to our societies. Um, now, it is it is very sensitive to the, to the extent that when when I see a child with with uh, the classical twenty one hydroxylase, that child be, be a female in her regular follow up. When I ask uh, about the gender roles and the, the parents get get a little bit uh, upset, um, so I, I totally agree with with uh, Dr. Ali. And and um, uh, usually they say uh, approach to to chronic illnesses is through the biopsychosocial structure, but in our society, I would add the biopsycho religio social structure in 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 such in such uh, presentations um i have to point out the suffering does not or or the psychological um, burden does not begin at diagnosis these individuals uh, if you if you look back they are in in uh, in in uh, a limbo and and uh, they are usually confused because most of them they have uh, gender roles that are not in keeping with their internal feeling for their entire life until a smart physician like Dr. Ali comes and say, "Well, we figured out what, what's wrong with you." So, so the, the the story doesn't doesn't actually begin at diagnosis. The story starts from long before diagnosis. Totally agree. Well, this gives me it gives me an opportunity to call upon GAAD as a society to put together some kind of guidance, some kind of committee over the region. We are so common among, whether it's Oman, Saudi, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, UAE, we can put something together, maybe follow the same model that's for diabetes in Ramadan, which has chapters and different things and religious and legal. Uh, luckily, this is less common, but it's more significantly important in religious and social aspects that maybe GAED can lead a path towards a, a start of a guideline or a start of a um, consensus, maybe. Totally and, agree. Yeah. And I think with that, we will conclude the session to stay on time. That was a fascinating discussion and great talks. I really learned a lot and enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And I'm sure our participants appreciate it as well. Thank you and have a great evening.